Hello everyone and welcome to the WRA interview. My name is Sandal Sanmagam and I'm the project director for Europe for the World Refining Association. For those of you who are not familiar with our work, WRA specializes in bringing the refining community together through our conferences, board meetings and of course now, given the COVID outbreak, virtual conversations. We are involved in Latin America, the Middle East, Asia and Europe. COVID-19 has generated both social and economic uncertainty. And given that our network is in lockdown and just like me here at home, we thought it'd be great to provide you some industry insights. So today I have with me uh, Klaus Peter Hausig. Klaus Peter holds the position of Vice President, Process and Technology for Fluor and is based in Amsterdam. He has over 35 years of experience in all aspects of the refining and petrochemical industries, covering catalysts, new process developments, clean fuels and heavy fuel oil upgrading, up to biofuels, energy efficiency and sustainability. You've got a lot of things here, actually. Uh, and also, <laughs> his, most recent, <laughs> his most recent area of interest is the impact of Industry 4.0 and digitalization and enhancing operation and reducing life cycle costs. Before he joined Fleur in 1993, he worked for nearly 15 years with BP in the UK and Germany where he started his career in the R&D organization, providing technical service to the refineries and refining petrochemical complexes. Mr. Halsig holds a doctorate in engineering of the Technical University of Darmstadt in Germany. He is a fellow of the Royal Society of Chemistry in the UK and has been awarded the Cross of the Order of Merit of the Federal Republic of Germany. Now let's get into this. Mr. Klaus-Peter, how are you doing? I'm doing fine, as you can see. I'm in a good mood. I even got some color into my face uh, because, uh, I mean, home office means also that you can just at daytime just step out and catch a little bit of sunshine. I suppose that everyone wants to hear us get into the technical side and what the industry is up to. So if we look back to mid-March when we had our ERTC advisory board, how have you seen the conversation develop with your clients? Many things changed? On the one hand, it is very clear the significant decline in demand. Mm -hmm. And suddenly you have an uneven demand on products. Um, who would have predicted in mid-March that you have to pay someone to take your oil off? Yeah. <laughs> so any, <laughs> any idiotic like that, who would have predicted that? Yeah. On the other hand, uh, you have an increasing discussion about nothing will be the same anymore after the virus. Yeah. And the question is now, how much will that be really the case uh, in terms also of that what we discussed at the March uh, session about the Green Deal, about sustainability, about um, CO2 reduction, carbon neutral and all these things. So I it is to be expected that there will be more discussions around that. And I think we might see in particular in Europe, despite lots of statements, we might see an a faster decline of refineries than people may have predicted. And you're thinking regionally or you're overall across the board? Overall across the board. Nothing specific, but I think um, some of the owners of some of the refineries just have no more buffer money. And when you have a six-month period like that one, where you have a, a refinery throughput of 50% only or less, there's no more argument to keep it running. Leads on to that main question I have with the COVID impact. Does that sustainability narrative go away overnight? You remember the board meeting. I think one of the colleagues um, brought up the question that people should contemplate which refineries will still be needed in 2050, mm -hmm. which refining yeah, capacity, it. or which uh, will be in 2040, 2030. So you should now look at all the predictions of the decline of gasoline and diesel consumption, and then you might already relate that into a number of refineries. Mm -hmm. And now I'm sure that the larger oil companies with several refineries haven't know very well which refinery is still relatively modern and where any investment for the next 20 years would still make sense. Because you, when we talked also about residue upgrading, a residue upgrade is always a billion dollar and more. So you would not like to invest that in a refinery where you know the refinery is 60 years of age and you have to replace over the next couple of years many items. You might not invest there a billion dollar. 
Next question I had actually when we, so we can keep with this COVID theme is how it's affecting your clients in the short term when you're looking at their maintenance schedules and also how they're actually approaching their day to day. How, how has that changed? Um, the experience I have with some of the clients I'm working with right now is quite interesting. It, just like with my colleagues at Fleur, it works astonishingly well. And people are coming closer together than before because you need to talk more openly also with each other. And um, also everyone uh, wants to provide a contribution for things to go on well. And uh, there is no extra grind with the CEO <coughs> or card jobs or whatever. It is Corona. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Corona, like, it, it has affected all of our habits. But do you think, do you think that's going to be the big issue? I think the behavioral habits, uh, for example, when in the past we tried to execute a HACCP or whatever, and it was clear that a HACCP, you have to be, all have to be in one meeting room, you have to travel and you have to stay and whatever. And now we have performed HACCPs on big plants via video and it worked because everyone wanted it to make work. And people realized it is, they can easier make a break and then continue, and it is not that exhausting as it was in the past. So there are, just as a little example, and there are many others of that kind, where people experience something which was thought to be impossible before. And so therefore, efficiency improvements can be done. This Mm -hmm. is not refining operation. I talk now about when we talk with the client about designing a plant and have to perform certain uh, reviews. There will be many other behaviors, and I think a lot of yeah, companies will be challenged with people demanding home office because it has been proven in a big experiment that it works. Yeah, <laughs> yeah the biggest experiment ever conducted. When we look at the, the way that these refineries are adapting, and you mentioned this earlier, about what is the refinery going to look like in 2030, 2040, 2050, do you think now is actually the perfect time for the refineries who have the investment capacity to look at the energy transition in the long term? In principle, yes. But the, the word in principle says very clearly there is a but. And this but is because of Corona, there are now empty budgets. Yeah. Yeah, and so therefore, uh, investments is being prioritized and only absolutely legally required or whatever essential essential investment is done or investment if you split it would make economically no sense mm. so if you have for example part of a project which is legally required and the part of a project which is a nice to have or which is economically good to have okay and if you can't separate them because you have to shut down the same plant okay then you execute it but otherwise um, it is very clear that we will not see many a new investments this year until the economy has come back. That's a good point, actually, because just before the outbreak as well, we've seen Repsol and BP, they announced that they're going for this carbon neutral target. So, I mean, do you still feel that net zero is realistic? <laughs> I mean, uh, I, I do not have a crystal ball. I, um, <laughs> as long as you have within that uh, carbon neutral target, as long as you have their a line item in buying carbon credits, you have a flexibility and you can adjust, you can balance. So from that point of view, it is very good to have targets and it's very good to to look on a strategy how you can achieve those targets and that these targets or that the strategy has to be adapted, changed, because I hope that my uh, technology successes are as innovative as my generation, the earlier generation was, that people will find something, uh, how to to come to that would be great. But I think just to base it on biofuels there, I just have always the question of how much biomass is available and how much energy does it take to convert? Does this really make sense? And I think that is where people are now more and more waking up to that you have really to look into the the full life cycle cost of of an investment and then also in the destruction of that and i think yeah. that way of thinking will be becoming more and more relevant
This really fits well into the big question in Europe about the Green Deal, the Commission's Green Deal and holding up, especially as you mentioned with not refinery budgets, but governmental budgets, those are also being hit part of but what, what are your thoughts on that because then that will obviously shift cross to uh, the oil majors and other refineries as well yeah but i think uh, carbon neutral or green deal are in principle very similar in terms of their approaches and uh, it's it, what i mean with similar is you have to develop something to invest something uh, to um, yeah as people <coughs> call it save the planet in a way and and to make things more effective however where sometimes the reality check or needs to be done a little bit more thoroughly before something is being uh, then highlighted as a, as a target or as a, something which has to be achieved. I understand that it has been successful with clean fuels where I was very active in the period when mm-hmm. targets were given and I still remember at the first ERTC conferences where then the representatives of some industry groups highlighted never ever possible and whatever and i have that in writing i have a collection of those things and i know where they are today so things are possible but they cost money and that needs to be balanced in a way but the same with biofuels i think politicians love to hear oh yes we can then replace things with biofuels there i have a private skepticism so I suppose this leads us on to the new theme then of technology and where where they could they see the biggest ROI? Oh, I think if some can improve uh, the energy efficiency of a carbon dioxide uh, removal unit, which is today still consuming 10 to 20 percent of the energy, for example, of a power plant, if then the carbon sequestration can be reduced by 50, 80 percent, that would be great. But I don't yeah. see it. Okay. I, well, you ask me. And I know that's. I, good I don't see it at all, and there will be some improvements. But um, I think the best is still to avoid the production of it. I'll bring something that you have become a big aficionado of over the past couple of years: the digitalization. Is how how are you seeing that integrated? The the key in the past, uh, when a refiner had made a deal with the technology provider to give him a feedback of how his unit is performing, that was then a feedback weeks, months after the fact. Today, with the 5G, and if it is implemented, the refiner is able to send his data to a service provider and they can give you in real time the feedback uh, what should be changed. That is definitely a benefit of this these developments uh, to run the units even closer to the maximum of what is possible. Uh, and you can plan better to the utilization of your catalyst and so on. So that is where digitalization helps. Digitalization also helps naturally in, in, in organizing maintenance, all these items, so that you can easily imagine any failure of a pump, which is forcing then that you have to shut down uh, the FCC unit or a hydrocracker as a core unit in a refinery that costs million immediately when you have to shut down. So if you find now new ways of improving of identification that certain vibrations in a pump are related to a failure, then you can prepare for that and you can whatever do then to avoid the shutdown. So these type of improvements of performance improvements of units will certainly assist in the profitability, but also in emission reduction because any startup or shutdown is an inefficient operation. So it's a key thing for survival. Yeah, it is key because if you don't do it, you're out. So digitalization is huge, but we're also from the advisory board, we're starting to see three theme technologies looking at increasing hydrogen production, recycling, chemical recycling got brought up, but also maintenance recycling and CCUS. All three were mentioned quite heavily in the advisory board, but I just wondered which out of the three do you think is going to make the most significant impact on the industry? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of investment done on producing green hydrogen from electricity. And um, I understand that electrolyzers are being now designed uh, to be larger, but still will be a modular operation and to produce on a regular basis hydrogen. At the moment, many people assume that the cost of electricity will be than zero and i think that will be not so much the case 
So yeah. you have to have a price for hydrogen then therein or for electricity mm. in <laughs> to produce then the hydrogen. And this is one way of producing hydrogen. Then you know that there is a development ongoing with producing hydrogen from methane in a plasma type approach where you then split the methane into carbon and hydrogen. So where you avoid the production of CO2. Okay, that's a development which could have an impact uh, because it, it uses hydrocarbons, mm -hmm. but it does not produce CO2. Okay, it's a development, but it could be. And hydrogen is the core component to be used in a refinery to produce products, either products for fuel or products for petrochemical operation. You need to have to put hydrogen into the crude. So that's core of the business. And anything which helps there to reduce the CO2 burden is naturally good. Therefore, I have also, for example, you have to think about also with surplus electricity, surplus, so-called surplus, means cheap. So which operations in a refinery could be operated batch-wise? Because in the moment, we are all looking high efficiency, continuous throughput and whatever. But if you have now, for example, wastewater plants, yeah. and you have to to vaporize the water out of the wastewater so that because you have zero liquid discharge could be done on a batch operation. So when we're bringing in recycling, um, as we were talking about earlier, that plastics, is, is that a huge thing? People have to separate there because I think PET, you can recycle as PET and reuse, even mm. on a lower quality level, but you can reuse PET. Mm. When we talk about recycling of interest for a refiner, then it is primarily this recycling of polyethylene, polypropylene, polystyrene components, which are, and there are some processes now in significant pilot plant scale in operation already, where mm -hmm. they produce then a material which can be regarded as a feed, as a heavy residue type material feedstock for refinery. And that is being planned. And so therefore, you can close a loop with that and you produce an out of this one through a refinery scheme, then again, uh, ethylene and, and propylene, and then produce again the plastic. So okay. that is possible. That will be done. It will not have, in my view, that major role as hydrogen, because for one uh, kilogram of hydrogen, you produce 10 kilograms of, of CO2. Eh? And so I suppose when you answered the question about hydrogen or reflected on it is the impl implications of CCUS. That CCUS is probably ready right now compared to green, the green hydrogen that many people are talking about in the future. When we talk about CCUS, you address two separate areas or three. The one is a carbon capture. And that is what I mentioned earlier. As long as carbon capture is as expensive in particular from flue gases as it is today, you have a problem. If you capture the CO2 out of, the, um, out of a hydrogen plant, it is significantly less costly. So these are the places to start with. But then you talk about carbon capture and then either sequestration, that means storage somewhere, or to convert it back with, again, electricity in whatever way and fashion, and hydrogen to produce then e-fuels or whatever. That's another approach. But people need to be aware that cost is five to ten times more expensive than the, the crude material you have today. And, and, and that you, for example, some people make a very nice comparison. They say with the electricity you require to drive a car 100 kilometers, you get only hydrocarbons out of it to drive the car 20 kilometers. Because to make out of electricity e-fuels has many steps. And in every step you waste or you lose energy. Okay. So it has to be balanced. Yeah, and, and please, I do not want to be misunderstood. All these things have to be done. They have to be all further developed because you never know which one, where there will be suddenly a major breakthrough and will be then at least one of the front runners. All these R&D activities or pilot plant activities 
have to be done because you do not know what at the end is the best. The final thing that I want to look at is IMO regulations. My question is, what, what steps have you seen your clients taking to adapt to 2020 regulations? In a way, you can compare it with Corona. Yeah. Because Corona forced us to think differently and to approach things differently to change the behavior. And that is the same with residue. And then I think over the last year already, one or two of my favorite consultants came up with numbers and highlighting that in principle, a lot of blending and uh, whatever can be done and would save uh, the conversion. And you may still remember the Warsaw ERTC just half a year ago. That was quite a doom mood of people in terms of further investments in residue upgrading because there were some people who clearly stated by 23 or something like that, we have enough residue upgrading capacity in the market. Okay, so I do not believe it in that word, but to invest now into a residue upgrader of a billion dollar, it needs to be in a refinery environment. You have confidence that you may still operate in 15 years. And that means you need to have, let's say, not units in place, which you have to replace anyway soon. Then I think investment is really challenged. That was going to be one of my questions. So that, that is Europe, yeah? be different in other parts of the world and will be different but in our region and and the surrounding region who is supplying the materials for europe you I will have a few selected residue upgraders yes but i think also people are waiting that others are testing slurry phases because mm-hmm. the slurry phase is is the process which has most likely the best energy efficiency it needs to be tested it needs to be seen in practice so in a way I was, one of the questions i was going to ask you is which technologies are proven to be the most attractive but i think the idea of blending is the best solution because not everyone has that opportunity if you have access to crudes which provide you then uh, with a vacuum gas oil atmospheric residue with a certain low sulfur content because you have such crudes then you can blend them or you blend them with other refinery streams. But it is limiting operation very clearly. Mm-hmm. But if you have a strategy to run a refinery anyway, only the next for the next five, eight years, if you don't give it longer, yeah, then blending is probably the best investment. Yeah, and then also now because of Corona, there's not much shipping going on. Mm-hmm. So the, the demand is also low. So I, I cannot see all the impact, but uh, there is no limit for creativity to avoid investment. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, from my point of view, but that's life. Um, well, I'm going to just say a big thank you, Klaus Peter, for sparing the time today in your lovely home with your lovely art behind you. Um, and I look forward to sharing this with our audience. Take care. Have a good day. Thank you. Bye.